Hello, good morning to everyone. I am Dr. Vishnu Rana from uh, RCU Government PG College at Tarkashi, Department of English. And today I am here to talk about uh, a famous essay by uh, Homi Bhabha and uh, of mimicry and man the ambivalence of colonial discourse this essay was written in 1985 and uh, um, uh, we need to start with the uh, we can start with the holy trinity of three uh, principal um, post colonial um, critics um, like Gayat um, the gayatri spivak uh, homi bhaba and edward said and uh, each is Uh, one is a different type of uh, writer and uh, uh, homi bhaba's expertise uh, lies in his expertise in his um, interest in extreme interest in psychoanalysis and uh, his uh, in-depthness to um, some of the findings of sigmund freud and uh, the post structuralist psychoanalyst um, uh, jack lacan Uh, so talking about this particular essay uh, there is one thing that i want to bring your attention uh, uh, is regarding that uh, this essay is a culmination of some of his other essays that was that were written before um, uh, mimicry and man uh, like uh, the other questions and remembering fenan uh, and uh, and some of the essays that were written after this essay uh, namely the location of culture uh, that was written in 1995 and um, um, that's um, that, that's very important because in the first section of this uh, uh, talk we are going to talk about these about these essays and how uh, they are very much um, a part of they are a corollary of uh, some of the uh, findings that he explored in these previous essays uh, that led to the um, um, culmination of um, uh, the mimicry and man the, one of the most interesting and famous essay by uh, homi bhaba uh, and generally uh, talking about uh, bhaba's writing um, that uh, it explores two major areas of post colonial colonial um, preoccupation preoccupation that uh, came into prominence in the 1980s and the first is an interest in the productive instabilities and ruptures in colonial discourse we all know what colonial discourses are the discourses that created certain um, oriental story stereotypes um, um, that justified the economical cultural sociological exploitation of the colonized nations and uh, their military um, um, uh, conquest of these distant lands how they justified all this and uh, the second um, refers to his in between which can be described as the creative malleable indeterminacy involving feelings of simultaneous repulsion and desire that exist at the interface between self and the other the second uh, section is um, is quite important in which um what uh, homi baba principally does he is uh, he is very much against uh, his fundamental critic is against uh the theoretical categories that some of the post colonial critics themselves have, have created um like uh, like friends fenan and edward said he is very critical to ed uh, saidian edward saidian uh, construct of the oriental um by the occidental by the um, the the, crit- uh, the category of colonized that is uh, very much uh, dominant and um the colonials having all the authority in uh, talking about the colonized and in, in forming those identity is very much against um, um that proposition of uh, edward said and even friends fenan uh, he talks that uh, for bhaba colonial critics like fenan and edward said in their systematic analysis of the colonial encounter on strictly binary lines paradoxically operates to reinstate the structures of authority which colonialism was concerned to implement in the first place so bhaba examines the psychic and cultural fault lines that constantly threatens the ossification of any simple dichotomous understanding of colonial colonized relationship so this is his very first and very important proposition that uh, those colonial discourses those very established entities like uh, take the example of uh, edward saidian uh, notion of orientalism um, that the orientals become a very uh, ossified and uh, monolithic category that is dictated by the um, um, colonials uh, 
colonials created the colonized and it is something very much defined and ossified notion so he uh, he challenges this he he challenges it some uh, uh, through some of the terms that he um, that he uh, uh, invented like uh, the ambivalence anxious repetition and mimicry this uh, these terms these three or four terms they are very important uh, in order to have a in order to bring this essay into perspective and uh, fundamentally what um, uh, just a few lines on uh, what um, uh, uh, edward said how Sir edward said was successful in creating uh, a monolithic homogeneous category of colonized that he called um, oriental uh, for him, Orientalism, uh, Orientalism was an academic project uh, uh, and his principal understanding of Orientalism as an enormous system of intertextual networks of rules and procedures which regulate anything that may have thought. For him, um, because he was, a, he was a follower, he was a, a student of Michael Foucault's and um, um, his essay Orientalism, is, uh, he, he owed a lot to his master when he wrote Orientalism. The site's final description of of Orientalism as a discourse of power or discursive formation that are linked to the exercise of power. So, um, in other words, Orientalism becomes a discourse at the point at which it starts systematically to produce stereotypes about Orientals and the Orient, such as heat and dust, the teeming marketplace, the terrorist, Cartesian, the Asian despo, and childlike native, the uh, the mystical East. See, the, these are the um, some of the uh, uh, stereotypes that um, uh, Said felt that the colonials were successful in creating and that identity remained intact for for even now. Um, but uh, Edward, uh, but uh, our uh, Homi Baba, he is of a very different opinion. Um, he feels that uh, Orientalism is theoretically naive in its insistence that the Orientalist stereotype invariably presupposes and confirms a totalizing and recent uh, and unified imperialist discourse. So he takes um, uh, again um, um, Homi Bhabha, he uh, takes, he has uh, um, this psychoanalytical tools with him and uh, um, uh, taking Lacan's notion of identity, identity means the othering. Uh, negation, uh, borrowing Lacan's notion of identity as negation, negation. Bhabha in a series of essay like the location of culture, the other question and remembering Fenon questions the proposition that the colonial colonizers identity is derived from and exist in an uneasy symbiosis with the um, colonized um, uh, and uh, for that he challenges that fundamental proposition and he feels that uh, um, again um, taking those psychoanalytical tools of Lacan and uh, the and the Deridian uh, idea of deferment, he says that uh, the critic uh, Aleka Bohmer, how how she fra um, uh, phrases it, Baba predictively adapts Derrida's idea concerning the necessary repetition of meaning. Any meaning that is in order to do its work to mean has constantly to be reasserted or repeated. This then is the role of the colonizer. That we are going to talk about uh, what uh, a post colonial, another post colonial uh, critic, uh, Leela Gandhi, has to say about uh, this idea of ambivalence as well as anxious um, repetition and. Uh, We'll uh, we'll have a uh, I'll start with the reading that uh, the discourse of colonialism is frequently populated with the terrifying stereotypes of savagery, cannibalism, lust. This indicates how in the discourse of colonialism, colonized subjects are split between contrary positions. They are domesticated, harmless, knowable, but also at the same time wild, harmful, mysterious. Baba argues that as a consequence in colonized colonialist representation, the colonized subject is always in motion, sliding ambivalently between the polarities of similarity and difference. He or she simply will not stand still. Because of this slippery motion, stereotypes are deployed 
as a means to arrest the ambivalence of the colonized subject by describing him or her in static terms. But this fixing of the colonized subject position always fails to secure the colonized subject into place. Hence, a stereotype must be frequently repeated and this notion of anxious repetition and uh, the term ambivalence prior to it that we used it. Um, as Bhabha argues, uh, the repetition of the colonial stereotype is an attempt to secure the colonized in a fixed position but also an acknowledgement that this can never be achieved. In trying to do two things at, at once, Considering the colonized as both similar to and the other of the colonizers, it ends up doing neither properly. Instead, it is condemned to be at war with itself, positing a radical otherness between peoples while simultaneously trying to lessen the degree of otherness. Although the aim is to fix knowledge about other people and for all, this goal is always deferred. The Deridian deferred that it, it that uh, um, what this is their intention to identify to situate this uh, this colonial subject and the ambivalence associated with it that that stage is never reached and uh, that let uh, that this leads to a fundamental questioning of their own identity how it affects the colonial itself the best it can do is set in motion the anxious repetition of the colonized subjects stereotypical attributes that attempt to fix it in a stable position but the very fact that stereotypes must be endlessly repeated reveals that this fixity is never achieved so this is the ambivalence that uh, um, the Baba talks about um, then now coming back to this essay after we have understood the notion of ambivalence and anxious repetition we can come to one what mimicry is um, ambivalence is their failure to um, situate the identity of colonized um, by their power discourses because they are themselves not sure how to uh, theorize um, how to uh, how to um, uh, uh, exactly identify where these where the colonial subject can be placed uh, it is um, um, something that they cannot uh, it is a problem that the colonials had uh, failed to surmount and in the process had resulted in an anxious repetition of those stereotypical images uh, and um, what this has done this has uh, led to a questioning of their own identity itself so uh, this is uh, what ambivalence and anxious repetition is about now coming to this question of mimicry what um, uh, what um, bhaba proposes that um, uh, of in his essay of mimicry and men bhaba builds on these ideas and explores how the ambivalence of the colonized subjects becomes a direct threat to the authority of colonizers through the effects of mimicry now what what is mimicry that uh, as we all know uh, he himself has mentioned all those things um, uh, all uh, that infamous macaulay's macaulay's uh, infamous minute in which he felt that um, they need a working class um, uh, they need uh, the englishmen who can the indians who can talk english but they are still not english um, Bhabar describes mimicry as one of the most elusive and effective strategies of colonial power of knowledge. Um, 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 I think we have uh, read it many many times that uh, what uh, workforce the English required after they had established themselves in India and uh, uh, so they asked for a new class that could uh, ape the manners of uh, the colonials and how aping their manners speaking in their language and um, um, uh, the Indians they uh, felt that they need uh, the principles of European enlightenment how how um, institutionalizing their ways of life they became colonial themselves and uh, how this uh, um, the power of enlightenment uh, led to uh, how it became a uh, anti-colonial tool this is uh, one of the proposition of uh, Bhabha that talks about he focuses on the fact that in colonized nations such as India the British authorities required native people to work on their behalf and thus had to teach them in the English language um, 
and uh, Macaulay's inf infamous minute on Indian education in 1835, in which Macaulay argued that the British in India needed to create a class of Indi Indians capable of uh, taking the English opinions, morals, and intellect. Um, these figures comparable to Fanon's French, ed French educated colonials depicted in black skin white mask are, are described as mimic men. Uh, as Bhaba puts it, Bhaba or to be anglicized is emphatically not to be English. Um, now, uh, what happens when uh, that how mimicry becomes an anti-colonial tool? This is very significant. However, these mimic men are not the disempowered slavish individuals required by the British in India. Bhaba argues that they are invested with the power to menace the colonizers because they threaten to disclose the ambivalence of the discourse of colonialism, which the use of stereotypes anxiously tries to conceal. Hearing their language returning through the mouths of the colonized, the colonizers are faced with the warring threat of resemblance between colonizers and colonized. This threatens to collapse the Orientalist structure of knowledge in which such oppositional distinctions are made. The ambivalent position of the colonized mimic men in relation to the colonizers is in Bhabha's thinking a source of anti-colonial resistance. This is very significant. Uh, a source of anti-colonial resistance in that it presents an unconquerable challenge to the entire structure of the discourse of colonialism. And we all know that a number of our um, national leaders like Nehru and uh, even Subhash Bose, they went to uh, they went to England. They studied there, and later on they used the British, the the, the old the, um, the the tools of British uh, to um, make this nation independent. So this is uh, this is a different assertion of Said's model of Orientalism. Here he differs from Edward Said, which does not consider how colonial discourse the gener the gener uh, generate the possibilities of their own critic. Previously, the notion of mimicry had been seen as a condition of colonized subservience and crisis, the measure of their powerlessness. Um, as Fennan and Edward Said both both comes back to it that how it is a, um, is a, is a they are the meek people who copy these colonials. We can find this view in um, at times in Fennan's black skin white mask in uh, the, its most famous uh, expression in perhaps V. S. Naipaul's novel The Mimic Men. But Bhaba refuses the defeatism in Naipaul's work and offers a much more positive, active and insurgent model of mimicry. So by revealing that the discourse of colonialism is forever embattled and split by ambivalences and mimicry, always doomed to failure in its attempt to represent the colonized, Bhaba avoids the criticism of Said's work by attending to the ways in which colonial discourses are problematized by the very people they claim to represent. So this is these are some of the very uh, um, this propositions of this essay how mimicry and how how ambivalence how anxious repetition how mimicry how um, they uh, tends to define a position that uh, there is a certain indeterminacy in in theorizing in in creating identities for people and in uh, and because of that indeterminacy because of that ambivalence how it it has affected how it affected the colonial mindset and um, when um, when um, they felt threatened that their own tools of enlightenment will be used can be used to expose um, their own um, um, th their own foundations um, and uh, and they had been effectively used as an anti-colonial tool by our own national leaders so this is uh, some of the uh, propositions of Saeed in which uh, that he problematizes that he felt that it uh, cannot be oversimplified through some of of the theoretical um, um, proposal, propositions um, um, presented by a number of anti-colonial or post-colonial um, writers like Edward Said and uh, Franz Fennan, how there is a further need to re-theorize those experiences and um, and uh, there is a legacy of a number of essays that followed um, from the from uh, the findings of of mimicry and men. Um, so it will be a very interesting essay to read. Uh, it's, though it is a bit difficult, but with the help of some supporting text, we can you know, go through the crux of this um, um, 
this essay. So that's all for the day. Um, thank you. Um, I will be happy to come to you again um, with some more uh, with some more topics. Thank you. <laughs>